welcome on behalf of Baldwin Public Library and the Friends of the Birmingham Historical Museum and Park. Um, before we, I introduce our speaker, um, I just wanted to mention that there's a number of events coming up that the museum is sponsoring and there's information about them at the back of the room. Um, the, the most one that's coming right up is next Saturday is the uh, Pioneer Cemetery Tour at Greenwood. We're supposed to have just beautiful weather, so I think it would be a, a really lovely opportunity for a, uh, to, to learn about some of the uh, early settlers of Birmingham. Um, we also have a Halloween thing coming up, and we have a, a presenter on Cream Magazine uh, coming, so there's a lot of, lot of exciting things coming up. Okay, well, we have Dan Heaton tonight, and um, Dan is, works at Selfridge, in the um, public affairs, and he is a veteran who served in Iraq, and he is a sergeant in the Air National Guard. And Dan has developed a real interest in the history of um, the air, our military in Michigan, and uh, tonight he's going to talk to us about Byron Jones and uh, Thomas Selfridge, two pilots, and of course Thomas Selfridge is the one that our Selfridge Air Base is named after, but also, which I didn't know until I came, he's written a book called Forts and Fields, which covers every military base in Michigan for, since 1679, which is really interesting. So um, without further ado, Dan Heaton. Thanks, All right. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much. So um, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, two people who um, were at the fore in creating uh, the place where I work and have been proud to uh, serve and affiliated with Selfridge for, I was telling somebody, um, I enlisted on Selfridge on December 21st, 1984, which was in the last century, which was a very long time ago. I actually was 17 years old. I was still in high school. And I had to wait six months or so to go to basic training. And my mom had to sign for me. And she cried. And I probably cried. My girlfriend cried. And, uh, and maybe America's been crying ever since. I don't know. But anyhow, so <clears throat> um, I just want to give you a little bit of a, a, little bit of a, of a, of a background. Selfridge Field started on July 1st, 1917. So uh, the U.S. declared war on Germany in World War I in April of 1917. And so we were in a, a mad scramble to uh, uh, create a military or to at least build up our military so that we could go to war in, um, in France and Germany for World War I. This is one of the oldest photos I can find of Selfridge Field. I know that the word hangar is spelled wrong in this photo. Um, I know how to find photos. I don't know how to fix uh, words that are on photos. Um, but I always show this photo because uh, this photo will come back later in the, in the presentation. And this is about two weeks after the field um, was taken over by the military. And you can see it's in, uh, in pretty rough shape. And we'll talk more about this slide um, when we get to it. This is uh, Selfridge Air National Guard Base today. Uh, actually probably this photo is about four or five years old, but everything looks essentially the same uh, today. Uh, on the, uh, let's see, on the lower left of this photo, if you're familiar with the base, that's where the tower would be, uh, and to the far right would be Lake St. Clair. The large aircraft that are in the middle are KC-135 uh, strato tankers. Um, basically, that's a large flying gas station is what it is, and um, Aircraft can refuel from that um, airplane. So what happens is if the bombers need to go somewhere, the tankers give them the gas to get there. Or if um, the fighters are over a combat situation and if they need to leave to go get gas, um, they don't want to leave the combat for any longer than they have to. So they, they hit the tanker and then they're back on the in, end of the fight in about 10 or 15 minutes versus going back to a base somewhere, landing, getting gas, taking off again, you know, and that could take however long. Um, the uh, mission, one of the missions that that aircraft also flies is a secondary mission that is near and dear to my heart because, um, and to the hearts of many, I'm sure, that aircraft can be equipped as essentially a flying ambulance. And so 
what happens is uh, a person gets injured somewhere, wherever in the world. Um, they're stabilized in a hospital at, at that location, and then this, this aircraft is used either to take that soldier or Marine or what have you uh, to Germany, where we have a major uh, military hospital, or back to the States. Um, underneath this, the, um, the white, and I promise to stay next to the microphone, but underneath these structures right here, and those are just sunscreens, uh, they're kind of like a carport for an airplane. Uh, underneath those are A-10 uh, Thunderbolt twos, and those are referred to as the Warthog. They've been in the news a lot lately. There's a lot of debate in Congress about the future of that aircraft. Uh, we have uh, approximately 18, uh, between 18 and 20 of those at Selfridge. The number fluctuates a little bit depending on what the maintenance cycle is because they go to the, uh, the depot and those kind of things. Uh, it just so happened in the day this photo was taken, right in the middle there's four small aircraft. Those are uh, Air Force F-15 Eagles, and they were from a base in Charleston, South Carolina. And it just so happened the day this photo was taken, there was a hurricane warning in, in uh, Charleston. And so what happens is when there's a hurricane warning, the planes from the base, uh, they go to bases all over the country. So we had four from Charleston there that day, and they were waiting, riding out the storm. So... Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, two fellows that had uh, quite a little bit to do with the uh, creation of our local base. Uh, the gentleman on the left here is Thomas Selfridge, and the guy on the right is Byron Jones. Uh, Jones was the first commander of Selfridge Field back in 1917. We're going to start with Tom Selfridge. Uh, Tom Selfridge came from a very prominent military family, both his uncle and his grandfather were both uh, admirals in the United States Navy. Uh, they both served in the Union Navy. Um, the gentleman on the right there is his uncle, Thomas O. Selfridge, and our guy is Thomas E. Selfridge. Uh, Thomas O. Selfridge, uh, one of the, uh, his claims to fame was uh, that he was briefly in command of the Monitor during the um, Battle of the Monitor and the Merrimack. Uh, when that was the first battle between ironclad ships in uh, the Civil War, he was the first officer on the monitor, and the captain was injured and during the battle, and so he took command of the ship. Um, the Selfridge uh, family was such a prominent family in the Navy that uh, in the early part of the 21st century, there were two different destroyers that were named uh, the USS Selfridge. Um, the second one is uh, number 357, which is seen in our photo here. Um, the interesting thing about uh, the destroyer 357, the USS Selfridge, on uh, Sunday morning, December 7th, 1941, it was tied up to the dock in Pearl Harbor and uh, had a skeleton crew on board. And, of course, we all know what happened in Pearl Harbor on that day. Um, the Selfridge was the only ship that was tied up to the dock that day that was able to get up power, get out of the uh, harbor, get out into open air, and shoot down uh, Japanese aircraft uh, that day. So there were other uh, ships that did one of those things, but not, not any other ship that did all those things. And basically what happened was during the attack, as they were getting up the, uh, getting up the steam, getting ready to go out, out on the coal, or out into the open water, was the captain was on board, and he set, sent a couple of his chief petty officers out onto the dock, and as the sailors were running around, you know, kind of to and fro during the, uh, during the attack, the chief petty officers was literally grabbing sailors on the dock and sending them up the uh, gangplank and saying, you know, congratulations, you're on our crew, essentially for the duration. And so this ship uh, served with distinction in the Pacific Campaign throughout the, uh, throughout the Second World War. This is a picture of our man, Thomas Selfridge. Um, he grew up in San Francisco. Um, he applied, initially applied to attend the U.S. Navy Academy uh, in, in Annapolis uh, when he was 16 years old, which at that time was not an uncommon thing for um, young men of that age uh, to, uh, uh, to enter the Navy, and even younger men. Uh, he didn't get into the Naval Academy when he was 16, so when he was 17, he applied for West Point, uh, was accepted and graduated from West Point. He graduated from West Point in 1903, in June of 1903. One of his classmates was Douglas MacArthur, who became famous um, uh, a number of years later, both in World War II and in Korea. And 
it's significant that Tom Selfridge there graduated from West Point in 1903 because later that same year, a couple of fellows, um, oops, a couple of fellows from Dayton, Ohio, uh, went out to North Carolina and made the first aircraft flight. So Tom Selfridge was uh, graduated from West Point for about six months before the Wright brothers made their first uh, made their first flight. So he initially was assigned to the cavalry. Uh, Selfridge's first assignment was to San Francisco, California. So join the Army, see the world. Uh, Selfridge grew up in San Francisco and was assigned back to San Francisco after going to West Point. So it's kind of like a kid from uh, Macomb County that joins the Air Force and spends 26 years at Selfridge. But it was very fortuitous for Selfridge that he was assigned to San Francisco because while he was there, the San Francisco earthquake took place. And this is a picture of the San Francisco earthquake and some of the aftermath thereof. And at the time, San Francisco was the uh, center of the United States military in the western part of the country. And so that was kind of like the command for the western district. And it was under the command of this uh, rather distinguished looking gentleman. And his name is Frederick Funston. And uh, General Funston had won a Medal of Honor during the Philippine insurrection in 1899. And now he's the commander in San Francisco. And what he does is in uh, 19 oh, let me say the correct date for the, uh, for the um, earthquake. In April, uh, in April of 1906 is when the earthquake is. So you can imagine he can't just call up the White House and get instructions because uh, communication is pretty limited at that time. And so Funston declares martial law in the city of San Francisco, and he sends his soldiers out into the city uh, to regain control of the city, and he sends them out with uh, instructions to shoot looters on sight and ask questions later. Well, it was very difficult for the soldiers to find their way around the city because all of the major landmarks had been destroyed because of, the, uh, because of the earthquake and the resulting fires. And so Tom Selfridge was in charge of security for the whole city at night. And he performed admirably in that, in that function because he knew his way around the city and could direct his soldiers accordingly because he was able to say, hey, you know, um, you know Maple Street is uh, 10 blocks down or whatever the case without having to know that, you know, it's where the big uh, building is or what have you. So Selfridge does such a wonderful job at uh, San Francisco that the Army says to him, uh, Selfridge, you get your choice of assignments. Your, your time in San Francisco is over. You've been there for about three years. It's time for your next assignment. Where would you like to go? And, you know, what an incredible opportunity for, for a young man. And Selfridge is uncertain of what it is that he should ask for because the world is his oyster, and he doesn't know what to ask for. So he asked the Army for permission to go back to West Point and to serve one year as an instructor uh, and then tell the Army what his choice is. And the Army agrees to that, and they send him back to West Point, which is in the uh, state of New York. And while Selfridge is in New York, he is trying all sorts of things. He uh, dabbles with the artillery. He's doing geometry. He is translating a lot of military records out of German and into English so that he can learn from, from these militaries. And one of the things that he does is he gets really excited about this new concept of flight. This is about three years after the Wright brothers have made their first flight. And so Tom Selfridge writes a letter to these guys. This is Orville and Wilbur Wright. And Orville is in the, uh, in the tan jacket there. And uh, Selfridge writes a letter to Orville and Wilbur and says, hey, I would like to come and listen, you don't have to pay me because I'm paid by the Army. I want to just come and uh, I want to be in the workshop. I want to I help with the flights. I, whatever, you know, I can sweep up. You, whatever it is, I am willing to do it because I want to learn about the flight. Well, the Wright brothers were really, really interested in inventing an airplane, and there was only one thing that they were more interested in than inventing an airplane, and that was in selling airplanes. And so the last thing in the world that these guys wanted 
was some guy from the U.S. government hanging around getting all their secrets. And so uh, the Wright brothers say, Selfridge, hit the road. You know, we want nothing to do with you. Um, stay away. Well, Selfridge is pretty dejected, and uh, he's kind of moping around West Point, and the West Point librarian says, hey, you know what? I have a friend that maybe you should talk to. And the friend of the librarian was the guy on the right there with that uh, cool-looking beard. And if I started today and lived to be 100, I couldn't grow a beard that cool. <clears throat> but that is Alexander Graham Bell. And Alexander Graham Bell owned a property up in Nova Scotia in Canada. And um, this is probably about 25, maybe even 30 years after he's invented the telephone. And so, you know, he's kind of a, a gentleman scientist at this point, kind of a man of leisure. And he's really interested in, uh, in developing flight as well. I mean, the airplane has not yet been perfected. The Wright brothers have flown, but, I mean, it's a very rickety aircraft. And so uh, Alexander Graham Bell wants to put together a group of people and figure out how to, you know, really make the airplane work. And when Selfridge writes to him and says, I want to come and hang out, and uh, Bell thinks, this is awesome, free labor. You know, I'm not going to have to pay this guy. And so he welcomes him, to be, welcomes him into, his, uh, into his club, which they call the Aerial Experimentation Association, the AEA. And they form up in Canada, and uh, they get a couple of uh, young engineers from Canada. And then they also get this guy in this, uh, this snappy-looking cap, um, to be part of their group, and that guy is a gentleman by the name of Glenn Curtis. And Glenn Curtis is an engine man. And uh, Glenn Curtis, at this point, is known as the fastest man on earth because he has uh, developed a motor, put it on a motorcycle, and he has ridden that motorcycle more than 100 miles an hour. He has gone faster than any human has ever gone to that point. And Curtis didn't write a letter to the Wrights. He drove to Dayton, knocked on the door, and said, Orville and Wilbur, your, your problems are solved. I am here. I would like to be your partner. You guys develop the plane. I'll develop the engine. And Orville and Wilbur thought, well, when we finally sell one of these things, we can either split it two ways or we can split it three ways. So, Curtis, hit the road. We want nothing to do with you. So Curtis uh, ends up in uh, Canada, hooks up with uh, Alexander Graham Bell and uh, Tom Selfridge and the rest of the AEA guys, and they get to work. One of the uh, things that, that Bell thought was that he thought that whatever, they, uh, whatever was developed by the airplane, if they put it out publicly, that kind of a rising tide would float all boats and so if I have some knowledge and you have some knowledge and we put it together, we're both going to prosper more than if I just work on it by myself. Whereas the rights, if you search, there are very, very few photographs available of Wright Brother flights and very few firsthand accounts that were made by anybody who did not work for the rights because they were very secretive. They wanted to keep all their information for themselves so they could maximize their profits once they got everything uh, organized. Well, the Bell people took a very different approach, and they thought, every time we do something, we're going to invite the press, and we're going to invite the townspeople, and we want everybody to see what we're going to do. And the first thing that Bell thought is, we, we need to figure out how to best control an aircraft. We need to figure out how to make an airplane turn. And the best way we can do that is by playing around and toying around with a big kite, kind of a hang glider. We're going to strap a man to a giant kite, and then we're going to tow it on a rope, and we're going to see if the man in the kite, by uh, he's going to be in a harness, and when he tilts his body to the left, will the aircraft turn left? And if we control it to the right, will it turn right and will it go up and down on command? Can we develop these air, aerial on controls to make the aircraft fly on demand? So on December 6th of 1907 in Nova Scotia, they need a man to be strapped to a kite on a lake 
in December in Nova Scotia. Well, <clears throat> they're kind of looking around at each other and they say, well, you know, Tom Selfridge, you're government property. Uh, why don't we strap you into this kite and uh, see if you can fly? And sure enough, uh, Tom Selfridge uh, is strapped to this kite. Uh, there is a boat that pulls it, and you can see, you can kind of see the tow rope right there. And so Tom Selfridge is towed behind this thing, and he flies for about two minutes on this lake. And sure enough, when he uh, adjusts the harness and tries to go left, the thing goes left. And when he tries to go right, it goes right. And it's a huge, it's a huge success. And he's so excited, he's shouting down to the guys that, hey, this thing works. And he ends up crash landing into, into, the, uh, into the lake and destroying the aircraft, or destroying the kite. But Selfridge and, and Bell think this is, this is a huge success because we were able to turn when we wanted to turn. And there were photographs. And this becomes the first time that a member of the United States military flies in anything other than a balloon. So Tom Selfridge becomes the first a uh, military person to fly uh, in any kind of, of aircraft other than a hot air balloon, heavier than, heavier than air flight. Well, uh, Alexander Graham Bell thinks this is such a good idea. He says, you know what we got to do? We, can, we need an even bigger kite, and we're going we're gonna to fly this bigger kite. And all the young guys in, in the AEA say, you know what? Enough with the kites, old man. We're, we want to build us some airplanes. And that's exactly what they do. They build this aircraft, and this is, aircraft is called the Red Wing. has absolutely nothing to do with our hockey team. Uh, this, this aircraft is built about uh, 20 to 25 years before the hockey team uh, plays its first game. But it's called the Red Wing because they put red silk on the wings because they wanted it to show up as good as possible in any newspaper photography that, that took place. So they're really uh, interested in, um, in, in getting good press. Well, now it's March of uh, 1908, and the weather in Nova Scotia is so bad that the AEA men have come down to Hammondsport, New York, which is where Curtis is from, and that's in the Finger Lakes region of New York, if you're familiar with uh, upstate New York. And they go out on this frozen lake, and uh, Tom Selfridge is the chief engineer of this aircraft. This is his baby. He has developed this aircraft. It's flown on uh, March 12th of 1908. It flies uh, for 20 seconds, but for 20 seconds the pilot is one of the Canadians, first time a Canadian's ever flown. For 20 seconds the pilot swears that he has control of that aircraft and he swears that it turned left when he tried to turn left. And so this is a huge success, and this becomes the first airplane that ever flies developed by a member of the United States military. So Tom Selfridge is just racking up the first. So they fly the Red Wing, and then they come up with another plane. They call it the White Wing, and uh, Tom Selfridge flies the White Wing in May of 1908. And when he flies the White Wing, which is easy to say after you've had a couple cups of coffee, the White Wing, um, Tom Selfridge flies the White Wing and becomes the first member of the United States military to pilot an aircraft. So he is just, just the cat's meow. He knows more about aviation than anybody in the military. Well, as news is getting out about, um, about the AEA and the Red Wing and the White Wing, the Wright brothers are saying, wait a minute, we invented the airplane we filed the patent, so anybody who flies an airplane has to pay us royalties. And they file a lawsuit in federal court and say, Tom Selfridge, uh, Alexander Graham Bell, Glenn Curtis, these other two guys from Canada, your association, uh, Alexander Graham Bell's wife was independently wealthy, they name her in the suit, and they file suits saying, these guys are stealing our airplane and we want millions. And the Tom Selfridge and the AEA guys say, yeah, you know, we'll see you in court. Meanwhile, they continue to fly. Well, <clears throat> around this time, a group, of, uh, a group of aviation enthusiasts from New York form a club, and they put up $25,000. And they say, any 
group that can fly an airplane for one kilometer, land it, and then fly it again on the same day, we'll give them $25,000. And the Wrights say, no problem, we've already done it. And these guys from New York say, no, 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 no. We want it to be public. We want to be able to watch you do it. We don't believe it if some guy who works for you says you did it. We want to be able to come and see. So uh, Bell and Selfridge and Curtis, they say, all right, we're going to have a 4th of July picnic in Hammondsport. We're going to uh, invite the whole town to come out. We're going to barbecue a pig. We're going to have an ox roast, a pig roast. And then in the afternoon, we're going to fly our airplane, and everybody's going to see us uh, fly this airplane and get the $25,000. And that is exactly what they do. <coughs> Excuse me. They fly their aircraft called the June Bug on the 4th of July, called the June Bug because the first time it flew was in June. Uh, they fly it on the 4th of July. They collect the $25,000. And so Tom Selfridge is now part of the first ever group to win an aviation contest. So he's flown in a kite. He's, he's, uh, he was the first one to fly in a kite. He's the first one to make an airplane. He's the first one to fly an airplane. And now he's the first one uh, to win an aviation contest. So things are really, really uh, looking up for Tom Selfridge. But he's still in the military. And the military says, OK, you've been playing around up in Canada and up in uh, New York long enough. We want you to come back and, you know, Maybe it's time that the Army take a look at, maybe we should buy some kind of aircraft. You know, I mean, it's getting to be the summer of 1908. It's five years after the first Wright Brother flight. Um, mi military units in, uh, Fran in uh, uh, France and Italy and the United Kingdom to a lesser extent, they all have airplanes. Maybe the U.S. Army needs an airplane too. But it's so early in the process, they have no idea of what should an airplane look like? I mean, what form should it take? How should it, how should it be organized? You can see in this aircraft here, in the June Bug, this is a picture of the June Bug, and the propellers in the back, and this like, looks like the tail, and the tail's in the front, and the June Bug is the first airplane that has wheels, and they, you know, we're not really sure what an airplane's supposed to look like. And so the Army decides, well, maybe we should, uh, maybe the best thing to do would be to have a dirigible. And a dirigible is a hot air balloon that has a structure inside of it. So it has a, has a uh, wooden structure or a metal structure. This one was wood. has a uh, wooden structure inside of it. And then they fill it up with hot air. And then it's got, a, a, got an engine and a propeller. The Army's trying to decide if they should buy this thing. So they call Tom Selfridge back to Fort Myer, Virginia, which is right outside of D.C., and Fort Myer is uh, still there, still an Army fort. And out in the parade ground where they have infantry practice, they start having aviation trials. And they call Tom Selfridge and say, Hey, Tom, um, you are the most experienced man in the military. You've been in the air for two, three minutes. Uh, you're our most experienced pilot. We want you to come out and uh, fly this thing and decide whether or not we should buy it. So two soldiers uh, go up in this dirigible, and uh, the soldier in the, in the back, and you can see in the top uh, left photo there, the soldier in the back <clears throat> is in charge of uh, controlling the rudder and just, you know, steering the thing. And the guy in the front is, um, is by the engine that drives the propeller, and his job is he's got a can of oil, and th during the entire flight, he just continuously pours oil into, into, the, uh, into the engine so it won't overheat. Well, <clears throat> they try flying this dirigible, and it works really good as long as the wind is behind you. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't fly forward if the wind's against you. So Tom Selfridge comes up with a new, better propeller, and they're able to uh, go as much as five, maybe even 10 miles an hour when the wind is against them, slight wind. Well, they start flying this thing all over the Washington, D.C. area, and people are coming out from all over the place to see it. And it's a huge success, and the Army decides, we're going to buy that thing. We're going to buy it, and we're going to pay $50,000 for it. It's a great idea. The Army colonels and generals are all slapping themselves on the back. Everybody's happy. 
until Congress finds out that the Army has just spent $50,000 on a balloon in 1908. And Congress is going, well, they're not happy, right? So the Army's got a huge problem on its hands, and the Army says, uh, okay, what we need is some good PR. So what they decide to do is they're going to take this balloon and they're going to go to every county fair and, and uh, festival in America, and they're going to fly this thing and get everybody to believe that this is good for America, this is good for the Army. So they tell uh, Tom Selfridge and a couple of soldiers, hey, box it up, put it on a plane, take it out to Missouri, the Missouri State Exposition, kind of like the State Fair is going on, take it out there and fly it. So they put it on the, on the train and they take it out to Missouri, and right as Tom Selfridge is going to get on the plane, the Army says, hey, uh, before you go, we want you to test out something else because maybe we shouldn't have bought a dirigible, maybe we should have bought an aeroplane. Okay, no problem. Well, again, Tom Selfridge, by now he's been up in the air for like 12 minutes, so definitely the, uh, the most qualified man. And uh, he is going to test the Army's new plane, the, the Army's first aeroplane, which is going to be sold possibly by the Wright brothers. So <clears throat> Wilbur Wright goes over to Paris, and he takes an airplane over there, and he starts flying it around, and the French Air Force is looking, or the French Army is looking at it. The Italians come, and, and Wilbur's getting ready to make a killing because he's going to be selling this thing over in Europe. And Orville is at Fort Myer, Virginia, and he is going to try and sell the airplane to the U.S. Army. And the Army says, uh, okay, great, but we want, a, we want an airplane that can carry a passenger. So we have certain crime. We want it to be able to go at least 25 miles an hour. We want it to be able to carry a passenger. And we want Tom Selfridge to be the passenger, and we want him to be the man to go up in the airplane and decide whether or not this thing is Army ready. Well, that's all well and good, except for you may remember that the uh, Wright brothers have an active lawsuit pending against Tom Selfridge for stealing their airplane ideas. They've told him to hit the road because they didn't want him uh, hanging out with them at, in Dayton. And now Tom Selfridge is going to be the man who decides whether or not the U.S. Army buys the Wright Brothers airplane. So, you know, the little irony that comes in there is just uh, wonderful. Tom Selfridge is, um, no, he's not in this picture. The uh, gentleman in the middle of the picture there is Orville Wright. And you can see his aircraft. Uh, again, uh, what we might think of as the tail is kind of in front. The propeller is in the back. You can see there's no wheels on the aircraft. We hadn't really figured out yet how this was all going to work. And so he starts flying it in uh, Fort Myer, Virginia. And he's flying around town, and it's going pretty good. And he's flying solo flights, and every day thousands of people are coming out to see this thing fly. The president comes out, members of Congress are coming out, because it, nobody's ever seen an airplane before. And uh, Orville is flying this thing several days, several days, <coughs> and finally comes the day when he's going to bring uh, Tom Selfridge up in the plane. He's going to take him up on, mon on Monday, and uh, then Tom Selfridge is going to decide whether or not the Army should buy the airplane. Well, Monday comes and the wind's blowing 40 miles an hour, they can't fly. Tuesday comes and there's a thunderstorm, they can't fly. Wednesday comes and there's still rain, they can't fly. Tom Selfridge has a Friday morning ticket to go out to Missouri to fly the dirigible. Thursday afternoon, finally the wind dies down. Thursday afternoon, September 17th of 1908, the wind dies down and about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, Orville and Tom Selfridge climb into the right flyer, and uh, Tom Selfridge is closer to us. Uh, Orville's in the back there. And Tom Selfridge climbs into the right flyer, and they are going to fly on 5 o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday, September 17th of 1908. They manage to take off. They make about three laps around the field, and they're flying at about 300 feet. And as they make their third lap, all the people on the ground hear a large, a loud crack. And when they look up, they see that the aircraft is out of control. Orville kills the power and starts trying to fly it as a glider. They, they drop down to about 75 feet. 
Orville thinks that he has control of the aircraft. He looks over at Tom Selfridge. Selfridge says, uh-oh, <clears throat> and they fall 75 feet out of the sky, and the aircraft is, uh, the aircraft is destroyed on the ground. Tom Selfridge suffers a cracked skull, a fractured skull. Uh, he becomes the first person in the world to die in an airplane crash after the, after the, um, uh, after the first successful flight. He's the first person to die in an airplane crash, and that's the some of the crowd uh, dealing with him on on the field at Fort Myer. The accident happens uh, approximately 100 yards on the other side of the gate. If you go to Fort Myer, Virginia, there is a fence, and on one side is Fort Myer, and on the other side is Arlington National Cemetery. And he's about 100 yards into the Fort Myer side. There is now a gate at Arlington. If you ever happen to be there when a soldier is being buried, the caisson that brings the soldier into Arlington Cemetery comes in through the Selfridge Gate. It's the only thing that's allowed to go through the Selfridge Gate is the caisson and the honor guard. The average, the average Joe like, like ourselves can't go through that gate. Um, Tom Selfridge is killed in the, in the accident. Um, this, uh, this photo, and this is a, uh, a double image. It's made to, uh, to look at in, a, in, a, in an old time viewer. And I always include this uh, photo because in, in 1908, there are no ambulances. <clears throat> there, are no, uh, there are no cars to take Tom Selfridge to the post hospital. There are horses and wagons to do that. And here he just was injured in an, auto, in an airplane crash. And, um, and they're going to transport him by horse. They decide that, that the uh, buggy ride to the hospital would be, uh, would be too jarring, so they hand carry him to the hospital. Uh, they declare him dead there uh, a couple hours later. News of the death of Tom Selfridge is national headlines. This is the Washington, uh, it's not the Washington Post, it's, uh, maybe it is the Washington Post, but this is uh, news all across, all across the country that Tom Selfridge has, uh, has been killed in this airplane crash. Orville Wright is severely injured. He stays in the hospital for about six weeks. Um, and he is just distraught that everybody is going to think that he killed Selfridge on purpose. I doubt that he did, but um, uh, it's, it's a terrible tragedy for the Wright brothers and for the military as well. Um, the Wrights end up obviously not selling an airplane because that was their only one in America. Um, and so it gets put on hold. Finally, the next year, the military um, has another series of aviation trials, and the Wright brothers are able to sell their airplane uh, to the U.S. military. Tom Selfridge weighed about 180 pounds. He's maybe a little bit shorter than I am, so he's a kind of a skinny guy. Um, the passenger that they used in the trial the next year weighed about 125 pounds. So they found the s s most diminutive uh, military man that they could find to, uh, to do the trial the next year, saving about 50 pounds in the process. So Tom Selfridge is uh, the first great pilot, dies in an, in an airplane crash in 1908. Probably that would be the last time we heard of him, except for 1917 happens. 1917, the United States military needs to ramp up, needs to gear up uh, to enter World War I. They open about 12 airfields in the summer of 1917, and as they do so, they say, what are we going to name these fields? And they start looking for the names of all the military men who've died in airplane crashes, and we drew the luck of the draw, and we got Tom Selfridge. Selfridge had never stepped foot in the state of Michigan, has no Michigan connection whatsoever, but we've been flying planes on his field uh, for almost 100 years. And this guy was the guy who taught us how to do it. This gentleman is Byron Q. Jones. Uh, he's going to become the first commander at Selfridge Field. Picture of him on the left there is a picture when his, news, his uh, he was in the newspaper, he was expelled from West Point for uh, hazing, which is uh, the physical abuse of, of other cadets. 
Uh, he's kicked out of West Point. He manages uh, to get reinstated about a year and a half later, uh, graduates from West Point. When he's at West Point, um, Tom Selfridge was an instructor at West Point, so they were at West Point at the same time. Whether or not they knew each other is uh, an open guess. Probably Jones knew who Selfridge was because he was an instructor. Jones probably didn't know who this freshman was at the point. Uh, after Jones graduates, he goes into the Calvary. You can see the cross uh, swords on his collar there. He knocks around the Calvary for a couple of years, and then in uh, 1915, he joins, uh, excuse me, 1913, he joins the first Aero Squadron, which is the first flying squadron in the, uh, in the U.S. military. He gets sent out to San, Fran San Diego. Uh, he's in San Diego, and they, uh, the military has a flying school in San Diego that both the Army and the Navy is uh, training pilots at because the weather in San Diego is perfect every single day. Um, the base where he's at is now a uh, major aircraft carrier base. There's three or four carriers that are parked there. And one of the things that uh, Byron Jones did, he just naturally took to this, uh, this idea of flying. He, became, he becomes what's known as a stunt pilot at the day, what we would today call a test pilot. And he starts breaking all sorts of records. He's, he's in the air for longer than anybody. He flies a loop-to-loop -loop on purpose, lives to tell about it. He uh, stalls his aircraft and uh, recovers the engine. He flies the first aircraft with machine guns installed. And he's just uh, setting the world on fire out there in San Diego and just, just really making a big name for himself. While the groups in San Francisco, excuse me, I keep saying San Francisco, they're in San Diego. While they're in San Diego doing all these things, uh, a little problem starts on the, uh, on the southern border, on the Mexican border. There's a fellow down in uh, Mexico by the name of Pancho Villa, and uh, he is launching a revolution down in Mexico. And uh, all, all is going well for Mr. Villa. The problem that he has is he does not have enough uh, food and supplies and ammunition for his army. Uh, so he decides to uh, make a little jaunt up into New Mexico uh, and go into the town of Columbus, New Mexico, and take what he needs from there to supply his revolution down in Mexico. Well, that's a huge problem for the U.S. government, and they send uh, an army down to the uh, Texas and New Mexico border with uh, Mexico, and they are going to put a stop to Pancho Villa coming across. And one of the things they do is they send the first aero squadron down there with eight airplanes, and they say uh, we're gonna we're gonna punish uh, we're gonna punish Mr. Villa. So they send uh, Byron Jones down to uh, Fort Brown, Texas, which is in Brownsville, Texas. Brownsville, Texas is as far east as you can get and still be in Texas. It's right on the border. And while um, while uh, uh, Jones is there, uh, the gentleman that's in command is the guy in the middle, and that's our old pal Frederick Funston. We remember him from San Francisco. He's now in charge in uh, Mexico, and his job is to make sure that Pancho Villa does not come back into the U.S. And so he sends up uh, Jones, and the gentleman on the left there is um, Thomas Milling. He sends them up in an airplane and says, I want you to go up there and I want you to tell me where the Mexican bad guys are so that we'll know where they are. So Jones is the pilot of the airplane, and uh, Milling is in the passenger seat. He has a map and a pencil. And he, they are going to fly around, and when they see where the bad guys are, he's going to put an X on his map so that when he lands, he can tell Funston and the infantry where the Mexicans are. Well, they go up, and they start flying around, and... Now, first of all, I need to preface this by saying I know that, uh, that uh, U.S. military fighter pilots always tell the truth at all times, and they never exaggerate anything. Well, while they're up there, th these two gentlemen uh, say that it sounds like there's a lot of mosquitoes that are in the air with them, but they're about 3,000 feet up, and this is in uh, April of 1915. And they had never heard of mosquitoes or bees being at 3,000 feet. And what they finally figured out was the buzzing sound that they were hearing was actually machine gun fire that was passing through the wings of their aircraft from the Mexicans. <clears throat> and now these guys swear that they never crossed the Rio Grande, that they never left Texas. Whether or not they did or not is up for debate. 
But they become, uh, uh, Byron Jones and Thomas Milling become the first U.S. pilots to have enemy combat while in the air. So the first, air -to -air, the first aerial combat in the history of the United States Air Force happened in Texas, according to the official record. I think it probably happened in Mexico, but, you know, what's, uh, what's a couple hundred feet uh, either side of the Rio Grande? They managed to survive. They managed to land. Uh, eventually, the U.S. Army goes down into, into Mexico, teaches Pancho Villa a lesson, and the Army comes back, and, and everybody's, everybody's happy. And so <clears throat> the first combat flight of the aircraft is kind of forgotten about other than a single um, uh, historical marker that's at Fort Brown in Texas. Well, that happens in 1915, and everybody kind of forgets about it. And then in 1917... Um, the Army decides that it needs to ramp up and get ready to go over to France. And it decides that not only does it need a strong Army, but we decide that we need to have an Air Force as well. Well, <clears throat> we've got maybe, uh, maybe 15 pilots at this time, and we need to have a, a better Air Force than that if we're going to go over and fight the Kaiser and uh, the Hun in Germany. And the problem is uh, Germany has more cooks in its army uh, than we have men in the United States Army, period. So they have more cooks than we have soldiers. So it's a little bit of a crisis situation. So we're going to need to train as many pilots and soldiers and Marines as we can and send them over to France. So who is going to train all these military pilots? Well, once again, we're going to turn to our most experienced man, Byron Jones, you have flown one combat mission. You are the most experienced pilot in the United States military, and so you're going to treat, uh, teach these guys how to go to France and how to do aerial combat. Jones gets sent to Selfridge Field on July 1st, 1917. He arrives. When he gets there, um, well, he starts 1917 as a first lieutenant. He ends 1917 as a colonel. So uh, if you know your military ranks, that's moving along pretty good. That's about uh, four or five promotions in one year, but that's what happens when there's a war on. And what happens is, is Jones uh, takes the pilots and uh, takes the gunners at Selfridge, and he uh, gives them about a, a month and a half course of study, and then they, then they go over to France, they get about a two-week finishing school, and then they go into combat. Jones is at uh, Selfridge Field for, uh, for about four months, and, and uh, starts, uh, starts the training program there. One of the things he does is he's got a couple of problems. Number one, he's, he doesn't have that many planes yet because they're ramping up production. So one of the things that he does is he, he builds kind of a barge that he floats out onto Lake St. Clair, and they mount a machine gun on the front of it, and they put another target floating about 100 yards away, and they figure one barge floating on the lake and the target floating on the lake that's roughly the equivalent of air-to-air -air combat, and that's how they teach the machine gunners in the airplane how to shoot at, uh, at enemy planes until finally they get enough uh, planes in the air. <coughs> uh, Jones also flies the first flight at Selfridge Field on uh, July 8th of 1917. What he does is he gathers all the men together, and I always say, uh, let me back up. He gathers all the white men together because that's all there are in the military at the time. He gather, <coughs> excuse me, gathers them all together, and in the morning, he takes the box, he opens up the box, he takes out all the parts, and he puts together the airplane. They break for lunch, they come back, he flies the airplane in the afternoon. That's the first day of pilot training at Selfridge Field because in those days, um, you never know, the pilot might need to know how to put together his own airplane. So um, that was the first day of uh, pilot training. Like I say, Jones stays at Selfridge Field for about, uh, about four months, and then he too goes over to France and um, participates in uh, World War I as a combat pilot. Um, I promised we'd get back to this photo. As I said, the first flight with Jones took place on July 8th of 1917. You can see my photo here is July 13th of 1917. Um, you can see the ruts and the way the field look. Um, 
I would not have wanted to fly an airplane there in July of 1917, but that's what he did. Uh, so the U.S. military goes over, to, goes over to France, does a great job. Uh, we win World War I. This is a great photo of the World War I victory parade down Main Street in Mount Clemens. They uh, put one of the airplanes uh, on, a, on a cart and uh, brought it down the field and some soldiers. And the decision is made that, well, the war is over. We really don't need uh, Selfridge Field anymore, so we're going to close it down. And uh, so is launched the first of what turns out to be many over the years, Save Selfridge campaigns. And the townspeople of Selfridge and some congressmen get, get involved, and the decision is made to make it a permanent military installation. Um, it continues to be an installation, and then uh, during World War II, it's expanded significantly uh, to approximately its current size, and obviously continues in use until this day. Jones, meanwhile, meanwhile uh, he goes on and does a number of things, and in the late 1930s, he is assigned to the Intellectual Property Office of the U.S. Army. Now, what a plum assignment to be the Intellectual Property Officer for the Army. Um, I hate to make fun of my brothers in the Army, but, you know, intellectual property and the Army don't really go together. But in the late 1930s, one of the things they were working on was they needed, the Army knew that it was going to need, the, the Army could see, you know, the Army wasn't completely ready, but they could certainly see what was happening over in Europe. They had a pretty good sense that another war was coming, and they knew they were going to need some kind of vehicle. They were going to need some kind of a general purpose vehicle. And so they needed the vehicle GP, right? which becomes the Jeep. Well, the problem is the company that comes up with the best idea for, for the Jeep is this little outfit down in Texas that maybe, maybe, maybe in a good year could make 50 cars. Well, you know, that's not going to work. So what the Army says is, hey, company down in Texas, we're going to pay you for your idea, but we're going to own the idea, and then we're going to, you know, have Willis Overland and Ford make the Jeep because we need, you know, thousands and thousands of these things. So they take the idea for the Jeep, they give it to the intellectual property officer and say, hey, walk these plans over to the patent office and put a patent on these on behalf of the United States military. And so he walks across uh, Washington, D.C., walks into the patent office, and the man in the patent office says, okay, this is great, but nobody has signed where it says inventor, and we can't file these unless, it's, unless somebody signs for inventor. So Byron Jones, the uh, first commander of Selfridge Field, is the inventor of the Jeep um, because he had the packet of papers and took them over to the patent office. So uh, as a member of a Chrysler family, I'm forever indebted to him uh, for saving Chrysler. Um, but he has absolutely no impact with the Jeep whatsoever other than the fact that he invented it. Um, so there's the signature. I, I, it's, it's a fascinating story. Um, Byron Jones uh, serves through the air service uh, into, into the early part of World War II. Um, one of the things that uh, happened to him in his career was that uh, when he was in World War I, he served with a fellow by the name of Billy Mitchell. And if you know uh, military, uh, if you know Air Force history, Mitchell was a loudmouth general who thought that the Air Force needed to be its own separate thing. And he just... Uh, would, was very insubordinate about how he thought that should be done. And he eventually, eventually was court-martialed and pretty much run out of the military for forever saying that the Air Force needed to be separate from the Army. Jones actually testified at his court-martial in his defense. And Jones was from a poor family, and he needed his job in the military. And when he saw that Mitchell was kicked out of the Army, for saying that the Air Force should be separate from the Army, Jones changed his tune and said, I think the airplane should always be under the command of the Army. Well, by the time World War II gets around, the thinking has changed, and the Air Force is clearly on a trajectory to become a separate service after the war. And Jones is writing papers and doing other things saying, no, I." I really think the Air Force would be better if an infantry officer was in charge because he is afraid of what is going to happen to him. And one of the little known facts of World War II was that uh, a lot of senior officers who had the wrong thoughts 
kind of just got retired. So if you weren't in lockstep with, uh, with the high command, you could just be retired. Um, if you were an infantry private, you were there for the duration, but if you were in a position of command, you could kind of get shunted to the side. So in, uh, in the uh, late uh, fall, early winter of 1943, he is retired because he has a bad heart. Um, whether he does or not, I, I think it's kind of an open question. I think he got, gets shunted to the side um, because in, at that point, we hadn't, uh, D-Day hadn't happened yet. Uh, who was going to win World War II was at that point very much an open question, uh, but he gets pushed to the side and is retired. One of his thoughts was he thought that the best way to use an airplane was essentially as a flying piece of artillery. So as the infantry is advancing, the airplane could be flying and could be dropping artillery in front of the infantry. And he thought that an infantry soldier should be in charge of that process. Well, he was kind of right in how the ground forces and the air forces could be integrated, but he misjudged who the air people thought should be in charge, because now it's uh, folks who wear blue suits who are in charge of that. But his idea was, was right on, because this is one of the airplanes that we fly at Selfridge today, and uh, this is an A-10 Warthog. You can't see it very well in this photo, but right here, there's a big old cannon sticking out of the front of this thing, and it shoots a, uh, it's a Gatlin gun that shoots a bullet about that long, and it was designed to kill tanks in, uh, in the Cold War. It was designed to kill Russian tanks. And so now we fly these in Afghanistan. They're low, they're slow, they're ugly, they don't go fast, they can't break the speed of sound, they don't have afterburners or any of that cool stuff. But if your son or daughter is a soldier on the ground, this is the thing you want flying over them because the bad guys can't, can't kill this thing, and most of the times when this thing shows up, the bad guys just leave because it, it's almost indestructible, almost. Um, so, so Jones was right in the integration of, of uh, ground power and air power. He just was wrong about who should be in charge of all that. Okay, so that is just a real quick rundown of the two guys who uh, I say were uh, influential in uh, creating Selfridge Field. Uh, those are copies of my of my books. Of course, I sell them. I'll I'll write my name in them. I'll uh, you know I'll uh, kiss babies, um, all those things. And I'll also take uh, any questions that you might have. Yeah. Oh well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, you know I, I'll tell you, I've been part of the I've been part of the uh, uh, United States Air Force for almost 30 years, I, I believe that the Air Force and the, and the military in general can be used as a power for good. I mean, I really believe that because I, correctly used, there's no limit to the, to the good things that we could do. Whether it's being correctly used or not is a question for, you know, everybody else. But, you know, I mean, I, I really do. And, you know, I have seen so many young men and, and young women that have uh, had opportunities, myself included, you know, I mean, I'm not from a wealthy family, but just had opportunities. I've been all over the world, uh, all because uh, standing on the shoulders of giants. So, yes, sir, in the back. <coughs> the yes. Should it be out or should we yes. I, so here's the deal. When I'm, uh, you know, uh, during the day, I'm a, I'm a sergeant, and uh, uh, I'm going to do what uh, my elected leaders uh, say that I should do. The, here's, the, here's the thing about the A-10. It does one thing really, really, really well. And it does one thing really, really well. I mean, it can do some other things a little bit. Um, the, the question is, is can the country afford an aircraft that does one thing super well, or would the country be better having one aircraft that can do five different things pretty darn good? And, you know, that's a question for no, nothing, can, nothing, can do, um, nothing can do close air support like this aircraft can because it's, because it's slow. When we started flying this aircraft, we were flying F-16s before this, and I asked one of the pilots, I said, what's the biggest difference? He said, 
I got to slow down my thinking because I'm thinking at the, I'm thinking at Mach one and this thing's flying at you know 200 miles an hour. I got to slow down and but that's that's good if you're doing this kind of mission. You want you want to be seen. You want the bad guys to see it because you know if we don't have to shoot the bad guys, then all the better. I mean if. That is a that is a question for uh, that is a question for people way above me, way above me. But I, it seems like it, it seems like it. But yes, sir, Did, right here. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. 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 The, the, the body design for the Jeep, the patent is owned by the United States Army. Now, I'm going to tell you that, that that history is like a lot of things that deal with the, with the uh, government, very confusing. And I'm not an expert on it. But I, but, I, but I do know that somehow the U.S. Army took control of the patent of the, of the, uh, of the body and yeah, I, I think that's exactly it. Yeah, I think that's it. I think it was just strictly a question of capacity. I believe that his involvement literally was less than a day. I mean, I think, I, I believe that literally he was handed the papers, he walked them to the other office and signed because he was the man who was there. Most likely. Most likely, yeah. But, yes, ma'am. Was there a permit granted in the Greek mug and the, and the Red Wing? Yeah, they, all those aircraft had Curtis engines, yep. And the other thing I wondered is, did Belfort threaten to disclose again? Let, let, me, let me back up one thing with, Curt, with uh, Curtis before I get to that. Um, Curtis and the Wright Company, uh, so they each had their own company. And they continued to uh, bicker legally uh, right up until World War I. And in World War I, there was, it wasn't the War Powers Act, but it was something, it was the World War I equivalent of the War Powers Act. And the U.S. government said, enough. We need airplanes. We don't have time right now to decide, you know, we, we, we don't have time for this. It's, this lawsuit is going away. We need you to build airplanes. And Curtis ended up owning uh, the Wright Company eventually. Um, the question on the future of Selfridge is an open question. I can tell you right now, as we stand today, I'm going to go to work tomorrow, and I'm <laughs> feeling pretty confident. Um, there is not currently uh, a base closure commission in process. We. We've been hearing that in 2017 is probably the next time that's going to happen. You know, what will happen then? I mean, it, you know, that's, those are decisions at the congressional level that are so far above me. One thing I can tell you is that Selfridge is a re relatively, at one point it was unique and now it's relatively unique in that we have Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, Marines. Uh, we also have the Border Patrol and uh, a couple other entities like that. So at one time we were the only place that had all that. Now th now there's some other places that have that too, but um, so it's a, and yes sir. Yeah. I've been, yeah, I've been, uh, I mean, fortunately, I've never been in a combat situation where I saw this thing 
used in anger, if you will, but there's an air-to-ground ra range uh, in Grayling, and I've been right there. I mean, I don't know how far. I'm not great at measure, but I mean, it's almost you could reach out and touch it when it comes over and fires the gun, and I mean, it's it's intimidating. It sounds like a zipper. It, yeah, it's a it's like a zipper sound. I don't know how else to describe it. The whole aircraft is built around around the. Um, yeah, in the first Gulf War, in the '91 Gulf War, there was a pilot from Battle Creek at the time they were flying these in Battle Creek. There was a uh, there was a female pilot from Battle Creek that flew this uh, aircraft and came back and like. Like half the wing was gone, the tail was gone, and managed to fly it back. And it was just in the news because there's an air museum in Kalamazoo that got that exact aircraft, and they were going to, um, and maybe they've already, maybe they're already done with it, but they were going to like deconstruct it to the, to its uh, damaged level, and I mean flew it back, you know. So the pilot came back, and the and most of the aircraft came back. I saw so. You couldn't believe that it could fly. I mean, it's unbelievable. It wasn't only that, but everything was so much protection around the pilot. Yeah. Yeah, the pilot sits in what they call the titanium tub. And um, I was going to see if there was uh, if there was Wi-Fi. If there was Wi-Fi here, I'd show you a little video on uh, on the A-10. Uh, let's see if I don't know if. While we're while we're talking, yeah, the it's called a titanium tub, and I mean you you can't destroy the pilot. For, uh